Um, so I thought today we would kind of go through uh, a full kind of linear regression, uh, kind of starting from nothing and then building it all the way up. Um, I would take a lot of notes because this is the kind of thing that would be likely on the final exam. Uh, so it should be hopefully useful. Uh, but before that, I wanted to make a few announcements. Um, so I know there's some confusion about the kind of dates and things like that. Uh, so homework eight is due on the 27th as normal. So that would be uh, day after tomorrow. Okay. Um, but then lab eight, which was released uh, within whatever last Friday, uh, is due on Friday. So that way you can use the discussion section on Friday if you have any other questions. Both of them are about linear regressions. Uh, so that should be uh, a sign. Uh, homework nine, okay, which will be released on Thursday, is technically due on the last day of classes um, because that's as far out as I can make it. Um, however, if you turn it in, say, by the seventh, there will be no late penalty. Okay. So if it does bleed over for you, you you know, there's no penalty to turning it in a couple of days late. Um, but I wanted to get the content in there. Um, so there weird way that I wrote that. Uh, so lap nine, um, uh, I believe that there is, it is just the discussion section. Um, I don't think we were actually going to do a lab on Friday. Um, so we'll kind of, we're still playing a little by ear. I want to make sure, you know, basically I'm trying to make sure that all this stuff, you know, you have like things to study from before the final exam. That's why I'm kind of releasing some stuff at the end. Um, if you are not in class on the 20th, uh, we will do something as a makeup for the uh, in class assignment. That was what was supposed to be the homework from Tuesday to Thursday, but cross wires with my guest lecturer, and he thought that I had canceled Tuesday and had to place it with Wednesday. But in fact, I wanted him to come to another class on Wednesday. And so, yeah, I found out, of course, when uh, some of you were pinging me saying, Do we have a class tonight? So, uh, yeah, so sorry about that. Um, it, it happens, but that's why there shouldn't need to be a makeup option, but there will be because it was supposed to be a homework. Um, so hopefully that all makes sense. Um, and just keep in mind that the ethics uh, component that you were here for on Thursday, or you can watch the video when it's posted, um, will be on the final exam. Okay, so that content is not just kind of sidebar, it is in the final exam. So just uh, keep that in mind. All right, some more announcements. Uh, alternate final exam. Uh, there is an alternate. It is on the 8th. Um, and just a couple of notes about that. If you have extended time for a facility reason uh, or whatever, um, the only way I can kind of accommodate that is by doing it on the alternate exam time. Because I don't know if there's like an exam immediately after or immediately before in this room. And oh, I can't extend your time. I don't want to make you get up out of this classroom, right? And then go like over to the other building and finish your exam there. So I prefer you to come for the alternate exam slot. Um, if that's a huge burden or something, uh, reach out to me and we'll talk about it. Any questions about that? Uh, just about like, will this lecture be posted? And is there a study guide? So all of these lectures will be posted. Um, they, like I said, they take a little while. Uh, so hopefully they'll be early next week. Um, I've actually, we will do a show of hands. Uh, so I'm trying to decide whether to do, so I was gonna do this kind of linear regression doing a different method, like a different approach in one of the next two lectures. But I also wanna do in one of the next two lectures, uh, kind of final exam review. Show of hands, would you prefer the final exam review to be on Thursday? And then you kind of have more time before the final exam, or would you prefer it to be on Tuesday so that it's like tighter with the final exam? So if you prefer Thursday for the final exam review, raise your hand. Okay, if you prefer Tuesday for the final exam, uh, all right, so it looks like Tuesday kind of has it. Um, so um, we have some level of final exam guides or review guide. Um, it's not, it's not as pretty as the other one, um, but there is some content there. Um, but what I would strongly recommend uh, is kind of looking at 
of the last couple of homeworks and labs, and that should be about the vast majority of it. And I'll probably do a pretty detailed final exam review. There will also be some final exam review slides uh, by Rohan on Friday. Um, so there should be a lot of content. Was there a page? I haven't fully decided on the format of the exam yet. So I will decide before I do the final exam with you. Um, but uh, I've been oscillating on, on how to approach delivering the exam. So I don't know yet. Any other questions? All right. So there's likely to be some level of coding component, right? And some level of kind of definitions component, uh, much like the midterm. Uh, the the format is just the part I'm kind of like up in the air about because it's difficult to do well, um, you know, or to give it well such that you can actually do a good job. So if anyone is interested, this is what I was doing last week. Um, I was in Amsterdam. I was interviewing people uh, in that car. Um, so if you haven't seen that before, that's the Audi e-tron GT. So it's an electric, 200 grand. Audi loaned it to us so that we can do these interviews. Um, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, if you have an extra 200 grand lying around, I highly recommend this car. It is, it is really nice. Um, but that's what I was doing last week. Um, at a conference called KubeCon, um, which if you're kind of, as you progress in your kind of software related uh, career, um, there's a concept called a container. And uh, this is an orchestrator for those containers called Kubernetes. Um, one of you was in my office the other day and I knocked their head off with complaining about uh, some aspects of containers. Um, but Kubernetes does orchestration. Cube by example is like a site to go and learn about it. Uh, and so I talked about it and I interviewed people in the last year. So, so uh, that's that. I thought it was kind of funny and thought I would share that. There will be videos, uh, but they're not up yet. All right. So, oops, you're locked up. Okay, so, uh, you know, kind of getting started just like we normally do, make sure I'm clicking in the right place. Um, and a couple of like UI functions, don't worry about those. Uh, so the question we have here is, does the SAT score predict college GPA? Okay. And so the data set that's there is some examples. Um, however, what I want to point out is there's only 84 rows, right? So what does that mean that we should consider when there's only 84 rows of data? That's not me, super Right, so what, what approach can we take to try to make it more representative or hopefully more representative? It involves stock markets. Bootstrapping. <laughs> Bootstrapping. Okay. So uh, when we have a small amount of data that we think isn't bad, but we don't have a lot of it, um, we can use bootstrapping to try to make it better. Okay. And so that's what we're going to do for this approach. So, oops. Of course, I'm going to do the server connection error on my laptop. Um, so the first thing we want to do is kind of see what data we have, right? Because we want to know if the data shows, is there some sort of correlation? So if we use a graph to display that, what graph should we use? I think somebody over here said it, but a scatter, right? So how do we do a scatter? I just say scatter, um, but I want to be specific about the approach here. So I'm gonna scatter using the SAT column. Let me just figure. Um, so it's a little bit off, but that's too bad. Um, and so you can see that there's the relationship to the SAT and the GPAs, right? Uh, and so what do you notice here? There's a positive relationship. So if I was going to try to calculate the R, what would I expect? A what? This one would be positive and kind of close to one. We can make a line out of it. Right. So we'll get to the line later. But okay. for the 
for the correlation component, right? We would expect it to be, you know, kind of, especially given that angle, right? We kind of expect it to be close to one, right? Because it's going off. Yeah. I was reasonable to use the GPA specifically while the vehicles is like more essential. So it might be completely unreasonable. We'll find out, right? So the question is basically like, why why is this our supposition, right? Um, so I can tell you that there is a correlation here, um, and it's been kind of pretty well studied, um, and that's why the SAT continues to be an entry exam in this college. Uh, there's also a bunch of interesting stuff there that um, if you look, at, if you use the SAT, it tends to favor people who are not in kind of underrepresented communities in college, okay, or in university. Uh, so if you don't test very well. It doesn't do a great job. It also tends to make it so that you don't get into colleges um, because a lot of, you know, if you're coming from a poorer community, for example, they may not prepare you as well for taking the SAT exam, which may or may not have anything to do with what you know or how intelligent you are. Um, just that you maybe didn't prepare for the SAT exam. A simple example is, you know, if you're more affluent, you can afford to pay for uh, SAT training classes, right? Whereas somebody who's not may not have that opportunity. Uh, what you are seeing increasingly, especially in poorer neighborhoods in the US, can't speak to most of the world, but in the US, is that they're offering a lot more free SAT training classes for people who are um, you know, more disadvantaged socioeconomically. So, but twice a day, the reason we're doing it is because we want to find out if there's an answer there. Um, and I have a note from background and because I already worked through this, that there is a relationship. Okay, so moving on. So the first thing we want to do is figure out what that correlation is. So we want to figure out what the R is for these two sets of data. So in order to do that, we need to use standard units because that's how we calculate the correlation. So how do I go about creating the, the standard, like how would I edit the standard units function to actually produce standard units given an array of data. Any ideas? Do I remember what the standard units formula is? It's the array minus the of those values divided by the state. Yep. So in this case, let me make sure I get my friends right. So let's screen it up. Uh, X minus, oops, nope, minus X divided by the standard deviation of X. Okay, so now I have a way to calculate standard units. Um, and so, you know, the first two lines of our correlation uh, method are, are fixed. Um, and so how do we calculate the actual correlation? Yep. Uh, just the mean of the X in standard units and the, pro the product of X in standard units for Y. Yeah, so it's the mean of, so it's hard to hear in this room because of the uh, traffic. Right? Oops, two times y. Yeah. Okay, so now I have my two functions, and if I calculate the correlation, in fact, we do get 0. 0.6, which is, you know, on a, on a weight of one, right? Um, I actually, looking at that picture, I might have thought it was actually higher. Uh, so it's good that we actually calculate what the, the R value is, because sometimes our our kind of gut check from looking at the, the graphic isn't always right. Um, because I kind of expected it to be more like an eight. So we don't have a lot of data, so let's bootstrap it. Um, and so, but before we do that, we're just gonna pull out uh, a couple of things. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is look at the median of the data, okay? And looking at the mean of the data. Um, however, let's see. So what we want to know, though, is those, they're, they're pretty close, right? The median and the mean. Um, but we want to look at 
what's a better choice for looking at this data? Um, we have a median and we have the mean. So why would we choose one or the other? To kind of get a sense of this data. What is the median better at and what is the mean better at or the average better at? And it is. You'd use the median because it's not going to be affected by outliers, uh, extreme low SATs and extreme high SATs. And those are affected people. Okay, so the median is going to be less affected by outliers. And if you look at this part of this scatter, right, you definitely see that there's some weird outliers right down here. So median might be a better choice. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to kind of look at that a little bit by saying, let's do the histogram of GPA. And so we can see, right, that we have some outliers, right? Like this stuff down here, okay? And so maybe that indicates that the median is a better choice. And for the sake of the conversation, we're gonna use the median. All right, but before we do that, remember what we talked about before is that we have kind of our ground truth data, right? We only have a limited amount of that data. And so we're gonna take some of that data out and use it for testing at the end. And then, but only work with the data that is not in the test. Okay. Um, so we haven't really done this thus far. And I'm not even sure that like the homework asks you to do this, but I wanted to make a point of if you have a set of data, right, you want to try to pull out some component to your testing data as well as your training data. And so in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take basically 10% of the data and I'm going to make it my test data. And then I'm going to go back to having my, uh, like the rest of the data is what I'm going to use to do all the rest of the work here so that I have the test data is kind of sacrificed for the end. That makes sense? So this is a, a relatively complicated function, but if you kind of read through it, it's pretty straightforward. It's just um, what, I would, what I need, right, is I need two tables, one that has the test data and one that has my training data. So I kind of need to separate it out. So the first thing I need to do is I want to go grab a random 10% out of my real data. Um, that's what that second line is doing. And then I'm going to create a new table that has the same columns as the original table. That's what that table sat GPAs dot labels does. Then I'm going to say, oh, that's funny. I, uh, I inverted the variable name uh, compared to the file name. Um, but so for Rona and test set GPA rows, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go find them, right? And I'm going to take those individual rows out of my existing table. Like I'm going to copy them in my new table that's called test. And then at the very end, I'm actually going to remove all the ones I took out, right? So it, there's not really an operation that says from table A, remove and add it to table B. Okay, so what I have to do is kind of two steps. First thing I do is I go and grab a copy of all of them and move them into a new table. Then I go back to the original one and I remove all the ones that I took out. That makes sense? Okay, and remember you can address a row by its row number. So by its position without any other information about that particular row. And that's what I'm doing here. So I'm just manipulating the row numbers. Yeah. You're taking out our list. Uh, from the first line, right, exactly. Uh, so that's telling me kind of what the sample size I want it to be. And 10% of the, it's like right around 80, so eight of them, give or take. And then I go and get eight random numbers in that range. Oh, actually, sorry. I actually don't get eight random numbers. I get the actual eight rows. But the, um, if you notice, I do replacements equal with false, right? So in other words, I want to make sure I get eight actual ones, not potentially have a repeat. Does that make sense? Right? I want to make sure I grab the right ones. Okay. So this just displays our set of results. Um, and so we just got these random ones. And obviously it's going to be different each time. All right. So now I need to do that bootstrapping. And my right, cheat sheet keeps blowing up. Um, so the first thing I want to do is 
to get my first bootstrap sample. Okay, and I think. Yeah, what I'm doing here is actually just kind of doing one. So you see how I do it. Then we'll build a function out of it so that we can do it in a loop. Okay. So what's the first thing I do if I want to get a bootstrap sample? What method do I use for the question marks go? Or R? Yeah. Yeah, you just use sample. And conveniently, because this is kind of the common way to do things, we don't need to add any parameters. Okay. And that means that I will sample all the rows, so whatever number it is, with replacement. Right. Because remember, with bootstrapping, we want to do with replacement because we're not sure the distribution is representative. Okay. So, anything else in here? No. Okay. And so, from that sample, I'm just displaying. Um, I don't, never figure out how to get this thing to go away. Um, so, I'm just displaying our original median just to kind of give you some ballpark of what we expect it to be around, right? Um, and then the bootstrap sample median, and then the difference between the two medians. Okay. So they're pretty close. Um, and this histogram kind of looks a lot like the other histogram. So that's a good sign. We're, we're probably doing it correctly. We don't have any stupid bugs. Okay. So the story of my programming career. All right. So next thing we want to do is we want to turn that into a method that we can do it multiple times, right? So as I kind of often say, it's often easier if you kind of write what you want to accomplish first and then kind of morph it into something that is more generic, right? So I'm essentially trying to how to show this, but so if I kind of just go up here and grab this, right? It's going to be the same code. Put that down here, okay? And but I'm going to call it just to be consistent with my cheat sheet. Um, and I'm going to return the median, right? And so, how do we get the median? We take the percentile uh, at 50 of our single, single, simple column GPM. Okay. And then I can run that and I get one result, right? So, as you expect, or I believe, right, we got a different value for that median than the first time we ran it, right? Because it's introducing, uh, you know, um, what we call jitter, right? So it's introducing some randomness into it so that we would get a different result multiple times so that we can get a kind of a sliding window of accurate results so that we can try to figure out if we bootstrap it over and over again, can we get somewhere useful? All right, so then the next thing I do is I basically just call that method um, over and over again, um, except that I don't. Um, and the reason I don't is because um, I'm actually going to grab. Oh, actually, there's no, there's no good reason. I just was dumb. I'm not written this part before I wrote the first part. So I should just be calling single sample median. There are one bootstrap median, sorry. I know there's a reason for it later on. Um, oh no, okay, that is why. Um, so the reason I'm not just calling that, um, even though that's typically how you would do it, for what I want to show you later, uh, I need to actually collect the samples. Because normally when we're doing this, we actually just kind of throw out the samples, right? We just pull back the medians and continue on our merry way. But I wanted to show you uh, some output that I need the actual samples for. So what I'm doing is I'm just calling sample, just like I was up there, but then I'm appending the single sample um, and into this other um, array, yeah, into an array uh, or list of samples. And then we grab that median and then we add that into our medians just like we would normally. Um, but that's why I'm doing it a little differently because obviously if I, if I separated that code, right, I would have potentially different samples, right? If I, if I called sample again. So, uh, that's why I'm doing it a little bit differently. Just kind of keep that in mind. This isn't the normal way to do it, but you'll see why in a few minutes. Hopefully. Okay. So, um, looking 
for question marks. Okay, so now I've gotten my medians, right? So now I have this uh, list of medians in bootstrap medians. And what I want to look at is the histogram of those medians. Okay. Um, and on top of that, I'm going to put a couple things. One, I'm going to put our confidence interval, okay, assuming 95% confidence. That's what this yellow bar is. And if you notice, I have my left and right up there. Okay, so two, two and a half and 97 and a half, which adds up to 5%, right? Um, and that's what's giving me the yellow. And then my blue and my green are the respectively um, the sample medians is the green, and my original population median is the blue. So I'm not in love with this result. Okay. Um, I would I would like them to be a little bit closer together and the histogram to be a little bit more evenly distributed, but this is what we got. Okay. So why, you know, so this this is a little disheartening as far as making this work. However, we're going to do some more testing to see if our, our approach is still valid, okay? Even though this is kind of giving me the, the indication that maybe this approach isn't going to work well, okay? Um, in fact, it was worse when, because I was doing 1,000, but I upped it to 5,000, so that's at least somewhat better. It's closer now to something that I want, but that's where some of the experimentation, where some of the uh, work kind of comes in is trying to figure out where, where is that sweet spot. Okay, so the objective right is a linear regression. So what we want to be able to do is based on given SAT score, we want to be able to predict a GPA. So in order to do that, we're going to create a linear regression. We got a linear regression, we need a slope line. A line and by extension the slope. Um, so we need the slope and the intercept so that we can draw the line, right? So in order to get the slope, who remembers the formula for a slope? So conveniently, we already have a correlation function. So I'm going to say R correlation. Um, just remember those were T, X, Y. So weird. All right. And so that's our correlation. But so now what do I do next? Yeah, go ahead. Pi r by the standard deviation of the x value divided by the almost. Yeah. Okay. I do it all the time, so I hear you. Um, I'm gonna pull them out though, just to make it a little easier to read. <laughs> so obviously, I could do this in one line, but it's harder to read. Excuse me. Wait. Oh, that's right. I did in reverse in my notes. All right. So we just do X and Y. And then, as you basically said, we're going to return um, the R times the Y S D. Divided by the x at b. Okay, so that's our slope. So now, how do we get the intercept? Because it's dependent on the slope. So, how do we get the intercept? Can we remember? Remember, you can derive all of this from the formula for a line. Right there. Uh, is the mean of y minus the slope times the mean of x? Yeah. So again, I'm going to pull them out. So I'm going to say the mean of x is equal to in t dot mean of whatever it is, t dot column, oh boy, column x. And then basically the same thing with y. Okay, then I'm going to return 
as you said, the mean of y minus the slope of t x y times the mean of x. Okay, so now I have my two functions. Um, and so this is where we get to what I wanted to show you. Do uh, we need to pull out the like standard deviation of the principal function? No, uh, it's just easier to read uh, for me. Um, you can kind of do it whichever way you like. I will say uh, the big one of the reasons that I almost always pull things out is you're most less likely to make mistakes because uh, you are going to be able to pin down where your mistake is. Um, okay, so the next thing we want to do uh, for the sake of kind of the example, um, you may not want to do this uh, for real, but for this case, what I'm going to show you is let's go create the slopes and the intercepts for all the samples. Okay, so I want to see what all of them are. Um, and so the way I do that is I take my samples that I created before, okay? And then I just do it a for loop. I say, for example, in samples, um, I add to my slopes, calling the slope method, and I add to my intercepts, calling my intercepts method, or intercept method with my sample that I'm looping through. Um, and then I push them all into a table uh, so that I can use it to render it a little more nicely in a minute. Um, but as you can see, we're going to get 10 of them. And so our slopes, uh, this is the only bad thing about this example, is that uh, the slopes are really close to zero. Um, so, you know, it's the, like, it would be nice if the numbers were a little bigger to be able to read. Uh, but there's our slopes. And then what I want to show you is, so we generated 5,000 samples, right? And we generated the slopes and the intercepts from each of those 5,000. So now we can make 5,000 lines, right? And so I'm actually going to do that, maybe. Uh, I don't see any bugs. Um, there it is. Well, this worked just fine in testing. Oh, I wonder. Oh, yeah. what's wrong with it? Uh, and I don't want to go here right here in class, so I'm going to cheat and show you the uh, picture. So obviously this may not be exactly correct. Um, but so here are our 5,000 lines just rendered. Um, and like I said, there's there's just some there's some uh, type error. So basically I'm like trying to use an ink where I'm actually got a uh, like a float or vice versa, and I don't know why there's bug. Because in this one it works fine. Um, but so as you can see, right, we end up with all these lines, okay, and they're all kind of in the same like place-ish, right? Uh, and we kind of see the, uh, you know, there's kind of a center line going through there that's kind of the average of them all, right? And so we can kind of go and actually see the individual lines that we have generated from each of the samples. We can go and actually figure out what are, what are all those different lines, because what we're looking for, right, is we're trying to say, hey, I generated 5,000 samples, and so that means I have 5,000 lines. Now I want to kind of crash those so that I can find the best version of all those different lines, okay? Or what's also referred to as the best fit. Hopefully my next part of the code is going to work. Um, it should, hopefully. And so the next thing I want to do to kind of check my validity here, right, is that I'm going to take a look at all of those intercepts, 
And what do I expect them to be if I wanted to, like, I want to kind of lay them out and see how they, they did. So if I have a histogram of, oh, sorry, I'm going to do slope first, then I'm going to do intercepts. Um, so if I do a histogram of all the different slopes, what do I expect that histogram to look like? If I'm doing a good job. And you can kind of see it in the prior picture, right? If you look over here, what do I expect those slopes to look like if I run a histogram of all the slopes? There it is. Like they should be centered. Centered, yeah, but there's another word we use for it. Okay. Normally distributed. Normally distributed, right? So we expect it to be a normal distribution because if it's not, right, then that means that we are skewed somehow, right? So it's not perfect, but it's not bad, right? It looks pretty good from a distribution perspective. It's pretty normal, okay? So that's a good sign. And then if we do the same thing with the intercepts, we expect the same kind of graph. Oops. Okay, and again, the intercepts we also expect to be kind of a normal distribution uh, to make sure that we're kind of covering the, the solution space. Yeah, the question. The previous, um, like, run, I don't think they were really Is it like? I'll, I'll figure out what the bug is and post something on Piazza. I, I think it, it's just something stupid that I don't want to figure out right now. I'm sure I just have a typo. <laughs> um, okay, so the next thing we want to do is figure out if there's a correlation, that means we should have a slope that is non-zero, okay? So, right, because if it's just like straight across, right, then that means there's no relationship there. Right. So what can we do? What would we our null hypothesis be? And what would our alternative hypothesis be if what we want to know is is there a relationship here? Would no be that there isn't one of those alternative relationships or an alternative hypothesis would be if there is a relationship? Right. So remember, we always want the null to be the thing we can test um, and the not null to be the thing that you can't test or, or is less testable. Um, so we'll just call it the slope is zero. And the alternate should always be the opposite. The slope is not zero. Okay, and so now we have our cool null and alternative hypotheses. Okay, and we declare them first, right? Um, and so let's find out if it's in there. And so in order to do that, we did it above, we want to take the percentile at 2.5 of our slopes. And then we basically want to do the same thing to get the upper end. Except we want to use 9.75 or 97.5. Um, and then we run that. And so does this prove all our null hypothesis or our alternative hypothesis? Exactly. So it proves our, our alternative hypothesis, you need me to say, um, because zero is not in there. Okay. And to kind of make it, to kind of like belabor the point, right? Um, we can actually kind of figure out what's, what's the other part of the region. Um, oops. Okay. But what should I change these numbers to to get the other part of the region? Uh, 
right? So, so my first one was the the five percent, right? So I know it's not in the the main region. So what can I do to get the percentiles? Because remember, we're looking at the percentiles. So we want something that is in the, the uh, actual results rather than like an average. Any ideas? So this may not be obvious. So I'll kind of. So if I do this, now we should see it in that region, okay? Because now we're like on the other side. I don't know, this one's a little hard to, to show, but basically the point being is just that, you know, we, we know it's either in or out of the region, right? And so if it's in the region, then it's the null, and if it's out of the region, it's the alternative. Um, okay, moving on. So, but what we're trying to find is that ultimate or the uh, kind of the best fit, right? Based on all the different options we have for lines. Uh, and so in order to do that, we're going to, let me just check to make sure I can handle myself. Um, we're going to take the average of all those slopes. Um, Slope. And the same with the intercepts. Okay. And so now we get a slope and an intercept that is the average of all of our samples. Okay. So theoretically, the best fit line. Um, and, you know, like I said, we kind of terrible numbers, but uh, zero, zero, one, and uh, six, or point, sorry. Oh, yeah, completely misremembering that. 0.28 or 0.29. All right. So, yeah, there's there's some element of the data that has gotten converted. Um, let's try. Oh, my. Oh, for some reason, the data in my SAP column is not being treated as numbers. What can I use to fix that? Because uh, it gets to be difficult. Um, let me just see. Why does that ever work? I love debugging on stage, my favorite.
right, let me see if it works. All right, look at that. It works. All right, let's see if the important one works. Okay, there we go. So, for some reason, the SAP when it was load the column, when it was loading it from the file, decided it was a string and not a number. So I just manipulated it into treating it as a number and then put it back in the table uh, and, you know, add and train. Um, so now the data should be good. Um, and what we did was we took our average slope and intercept and we generated a line based on that, right? And then we calculated the GPAs <clears throat> based on the SAT forms, uh, you know, so these are our predicted GPAs, and we end up with this <clears throat> yellow result, right, overlaid on top of our original data. And so that looks pretty good. Um, but then we want to look at our residuals, right, because now we want to know how far away are uh, that, like, what are the errors like between the predicted value and the uh, known values, okay? And so that's how we look at our residuals. So what do we expect our residuals to look like if we put them on a scatter plot? There should be no correlation whatsoever. Yeah, so it's good blob, right? Uh, I like the technical term, thank you very much. Uh, and so here is the kind of original scatter that we just saw, but then here's the residuals and Again, not actually all that great. It's pretty good, right? But if you notice, we still have some kind of weird outliers out here, right? Um, and so, but you know, the general shape's not bad. So that's pretty good. So then how do we calculate the actual um, kind of distance with our line, like with our predictions to our, our existing data? We use the, there's a hint right there on the screen. We talked about this before. What do we use to figure out the quality of our line? Somebody's got to remember the expansion. Like that's what mean squared error. Right. So we use the root mean squared error. And exactly like it sounds like, uh, let me catch up on my cheat sheet. So I don't make too many mistakes. Um, so we do the root mean squared error, right? So the first thing we do is we kind of go inside out, right? So we're going to do the first thing is we're going to get our error amount. Oh boy. 
which is going to be, uh, let me make sure I got my friends right, uh, C, C, uh, S A T G P A S um, dot column of G P A, right? So that's all the ones that are known, like our, our good data. And then we're going to just subtract the predicted GPAs, which we could also use the table, but um, this will be faster. And so that's our error, right? So now we need to square it. So we put that in friends and square. Then we're going to take that and do the average, right? And then lastly, we're going to take the root. So we're going to do one more set of friends. Just do it this way. And that's our root mean squared error. So we got a point two, um, which is pretty good. It's kind of like it's a little hard to judge independently, right? Because what what it is is it's a measure of of like this data set. Okay, so what we could do is look at all the different samples and look at the different root mean squared errors. We could try other lines and see if they're a lot worse. Um, but we want to see, you know, we want to be able to get our, our value back and see if it's within a tolerance that we're comfortable with. So basically this is point within point two of the GPA. So, um, you know, plus or minus. So that's probably okay for the sake of what we're trying to accomplish, which is to say, okay, we have an SAT, can we predict the GPA? And according to this, we're going to have, we're going to be within, you know, point 0.4 on the GPA. Maybe not as tight as we would like, but not too bad. However, the crux of it is, right, we want to do uh, the same work using our, our, our prediction line, except on our test data now. Right, so we've done everything with our training data. We know this is what we think the slope and the intercept are. Now we're going to try to independently verify it with that ten percent that we held back to see if it's still good. Okay, and so to do that, we have to get another set of predicted GPAs. So how do we get this this other set of predicted GPAs based on the test data? And I can give you a hint that the test data is in a brilliantly named table called test underscore SAT underscore GPS. So what would I do to get another set of GPS? So we don't need the sample again. All we want to do is actually predict them based on the line we already created, right? So we know what line we already created. Um, now what we want to do is find out how uh, accurate that line is on this last data set. So it's almost like we got a new sample, right? But smaller. And we want to just test it and see how it did. So what would I do just to get predicted GPS? So you do this the slope times the column GPA or the column SAT and then plus the intercept. Exactly. So we just do exactly what we were doing before, except now we're going to use our test data. Column plus average intercept. Um, and then I'm going to drop those in the table. Like, or into our test table. So if I'm going to add a new name just so I don't stomp on my existing data set. Uh, and so I call it test SAT GPA predicted um, and just do equals based on our original. Um, we're going to say with column and we're going to call it linear prediction. And we're going to pass in the results. So we're just reusing predicted GPAs. Probably should have renamed that variable, but I didn't. So now we also want to get the residuals. So we're going to say test SAT GPAs. Probably could use the predicted one, um, but I don't need to because I already have it in the right. Excuse me. Um, 
And so I need to get the residuals. Um, what do I do to get the residuals? So we have another set of ground truth, right? We have another eight elements. So how do I get the, the residuals for this set of GPAs? All right, sorry, of this set, it has a B score for the GPA combination. Hey, we just did this before. Right? How do we get the residual of the form? We just got the SP count by the the GPA column by the predicted GPA. So we'll just do column. GPA minus predicted Oops. GPAs and some typos. Um, and then I'm going to throw that in our table as well, except we're going to make a new table name again. Um, oops. We're going to call it. Or I call it residual. Oh, actually, one thing I would point out because I don't think I've pointed it out before. Um, one thing to, to notice, right, is I try to be really consistent on a couple things when you're doing like column names. So things basically, I uh, try very hard to uh, not have to remember things because I have a memory like SIV. Um, so what I do to combat that problem is I try to name things very consistent. Okay. So if you notice, column names are not plural. Okay. Because a column is is yes, it's all of them, but any given row is just a single item, so they're not plural. For this class, although I generally uh, and you'll see it sometimes in my code, I almost always never use capitalization. Okay. For this class, we have a lot of the content that I've kind of created over time where it had a lot of capitalization. Um, I either, but normally what I actually do is use no capitalization or I use very consistent capitalization so that I can back reference that I called it residual without having to go back and look at the table every single time. So it's really important if you think about it, right? It's really useful to get really consistent about how you name things so that you don't have to like constantly display the labels in the table or whatever, because then you can just back reference it a little more easily. So that's why I checked that it was residual um, because I know I'm going to back reference it in a minute. Um, and lastly, we're going to calculate the RMSC, except I'm going to cheat and take this calculation and just change which table I'm operating on. All right. And because I just have the GPA there. So now I'll get an RMSC. Um, it's actually not as good as I was getting before in my testing. Um, so 0.19 and 0 0.20, those are a little far apart. That makes me a little uncomfortable. Remember the scale of the thing, the GPA is right. It's only zero to four, right? So those, although they're not actually that far apart in this particular case, they're a little far apart. In all my testing leading into the class, I was actually getting a 0.20-ish result as well. And so that made me happier with my line. Okay. So, but I can also check by actually running the same model. And so, what actually we'll point out here is randomly, when I pulled out my test data set, it looks like I got a lot of outliers, right? So, unlucky for me, right? I should maybe do it chosen a different set or checked what kind of result I got from my test set to see if there was a lot of outliers. Um, because this is not a great example, right? And then my residual is probably even worse. Um, yeah, my residual is not good, okay? So, but if you look at my cheat sheet, uh, this is what I got when I pulled out my random set before, okay? That's a much better test set, right? 
And so just randomness came into the mess and I got a much better answer the first time. This is why sometimes with these things, you need to do it more than once, okay? Um, because it'd be perfectly valid to go back to the beginning, right? And start over and run the whole series again. And you could compare this result, right? And if you did that a few times, you could then say, oh, my test data is coming out right. Because as long as I'm not training with my test data, it's perfectly valid to do it again. Right, because I'm I'm going back and creating a brand new model each time. I'm running those five thousand samples again, et cetera, et cetera. So it's perfectly okay to run the whole thing several times if you're not happy with the result. Which in this case, I was, or in the prior case, this this result would make me abandon this and say this this is messed up. It's wrong. Okay, so before I said that, because all my other inputs right, seem to indicate. Ah, there's probably something here. So in this case, my theory is, is that I get just got a bad test data set, which is perfectly plausible because I pulled eight random elements out of 80. Right? It's not like it wasn't a ton. Okay. So kind of interesting that it blew up on it. And that's it. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, I think well, the residual uh bot, I think that's did I have a bug? Yeah, but in a previous sale. That would certainly explain it as well. Like, uh, for, uh, like for the task, as if he, she pays her schedules. Sell so, uh, Yes, it, no, no, that was right. Like the sell book, like, like. Oh, here? Yeah. Like residuals, so it's called residuals, and then it should be residual. Oh, oh, you're right. Here, right? Yeah. Yep. That makes some more sense. So the other explanation is you have bugs. Uh, it's still not in love with it. Better than it was, but it's still it's still not awesome. But like I said, it's like it looks like I just got a lot of outliers in my testing set. Purely a rent. Right. And I ran it probably three or four times before class, right? And not like that, right? It came out, it came out nicely every time. This is why we hate the demo gals. All right. Any other questions? Thank you for your correction. Oh, uh, the number for attendance is 32. All right, but with that. We'll call it a day and uh, we'll see you on Thursday.